All right. Thank you, praise team. Thank you, Emily, for coming and saving the day, filling in for us again. She does a great job when she's here, and I appreciate her. Um, and she, when she's not here, she's serving the Lord over at First Baptist early. But she's, uh, she's uh, at home right now. This is where she belongs. And I'm sure Mom and Daddy know, uh, like that when she's here. Okay. Um, wanted to talk a little bit about death. And that's what I've been experiencing and going through. And the thing about it is we all will. There's no escaping uh, death. It's a part of life. Um, but... Uh, for us, for those who believe and have put their faith and trust in the Lord Jesus Christ and the forgiveness of sin he gives to all of us through Calvary and understand that it's his shedding of blood that allows uh, our sins to be forgiven, cleansed, if you will. Um, basically, we were bought with a price. Um, and uh, salvation is a free gift, but... It costs something. It costs the blood of our Savior, the Lord Jesus Christ. And, um, but we die because we're all sinners. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God. No one is going to escape death. Um, kings die. The popes die. Preachers die. Everybody is going to die. Um, and you can't escape that. I've heard that there's people that have frozen themselves and... All this kind of stuff so that when cures for whatever diseases and things they have, even if it's just old age, are um, discovered, they can be unfrozen and live longer. I don't know why anybody would want to do that, but I guess some people do. Um, I don't think they understand, and surely they don't know the Lord, because our view of death is there's something better Amen? Waiting on the other side of it. So we don't have to fear death. A matter of fact, I heard uh, it said it's not death to die. Okay? Really, when we die, we become, we're in the process of becoming what God intends for us and wanted us to be. In other words, experiencing life as it really is. This is what... Um, Interestingly enough, if you do Spurgeon's morning and evening devotionals on June 29th, Spurgeon says this, Blessed is death, since through divine power it disrobes us of this workday garment and then clothes us with the wedding garment of incorruption. Blessed are those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Woo! Man, yeah. I mean, he nailed it. Hallelujah! We don't have to fear death. Now, it's hard to say goodbye, I know. And I've been in that room with other people and families many times, but when it's your mother, it's different. There's no doubt about it. Um, the only thing that can give you peace in that hour is knowing that they had a relationship with their creator through the Lord Jesus Christ. So, with that being said, if you would stand with me, the first verse we're going to read is where Spurgeon uh, drew that statement from on uh, June 29th. Um, as he used 1 Thessalonians 4.14 for his devotion on that day. And it says, and Paul writes, For if we believe that Jesus died and rose again, even so God will bring with him those who have fallen asleep in Jesus. Amen? Amen. Amen. Woo! Yeah! That's good stuff. You may be seated. I mean, get excited about it. Because it's, it's hard to say goodbye, but it's awesome to know that it's all good. It's all going to be okay. Now, let's think about this a little bit. Last two weeks, it's been tough. 
probably I would have to admit the hardest maybe two weeks um, I think I've ever had in my life. Um, and the question we always have is, well, what happens when we die? That's where I got my sermon title. That in 1 Corinthians 15, we'll read it here in a second. Oh, death. Oh, death. Where's your sting? Where is your victory? That's all been taken care of in Jesus Christ. Make sure you have faith and belief in the Jesus of the Bible. It's not what you hope or you think or you dream or you feel or what you desire. It's what this book tells us. Folks, I'm just telling you, you don't have to go see a movie about what somebody else experienced. You don't have to read a book about what somebody else went through or how that. I'm just telling you, all you need is this book. And it tells you everything you need to know about what we're going to experience when we step through that door of physical death and what happens to us. Now, one of the best uh, areas that you can go to to kind of get some understanding about what happens to us when we die is Luke 16, 19 through 31. And Jesus tells the parable there uh, of the rich man and Lazarus. And in that parable, uh, Lazarus pretty much has it made on earth. Everything's good. He has everything he wants. Um, the rich man, Lazarus, poor beggar out in the streets. He has nothing. And when they die, Lazarus um, goes one place and the poor beggar goes to another. They're separated. The thing we need to understand is, as I said, everybody dies. There's physical laws that are going to be followed. And there's many reasons that we die. Sin is uh, the um, thing that propels that. But the bottom line is we all die. My mother died because her physical body was wore out. That's just, that's what it was. She had to have a surgery. She didn't want to. She chose to because they told her if you don't have one surgery, you're going to have to have another surgery. Now, I'll just tell you, especially teenagers out there, but young people and some others maybe as well, uh, the message there is don't pick up the cigarettes because that's what caused it. She might have lived another 10 years or so. We don't know. But physical laws say everybody is going to die. Even if you eat vegetables your whole life and never smoke and do everything perfect, you're still going to die. Moral laws also dictate that we're going to die. People suffer and die because of sin. Uh, Galatians 6, 7 and 8 tells us whatever a man sows, he also reaps. So if you do drugs, if you drink, if you smoke, those kinds of things, they all can hasten death. Um, perversion, greed, lust, envy go right along with that. But a lot of times those things affect other people as well, unfortunately. Moral laws. And then there's spiritual laws, a result of God's providence. Sometimes people die because he, God intervenes. And he can intervene and he will intervene in the lives of men as a result of possibly protection for some or punishment for others, depending on the situation. Physical, moral, and spiritual laws dictate that we're all going to die. And so this narrative that Jesus gives in Luke uh, with a sphere, sphere of real life to teach a lesson of spiritual truth. Parables are always based upon fact uh, and they must be true to life to uh, be of any value. So it's basically, as one preacher said, an earthly story with a heavenly meaning. And so... In that passage, as you know, 
Lazarus and the rich man are separated by a great chasm. Lazarus is suffering. I mean, uh, the rich man is suffering. He calls out to Lazarus and, and says, give me some relief. Dip, dip your finger uh, or tell the angels to dip their fingers in water and, and quench the fire that is burning. So you don't want to go there. Okay? It's a place of suffering and torment. Lazarus is in the bosom of Abraham in the presence of of the Lord, if you will. And of course, finally, what happens is the rich man says, well, then at least um, go back and and tell my family. And can't do it. It's fixed. Once you go there, you you have to stay there. There's no changing. John 3.13 says this, no man has ascended up into heaven. Why am I telling you this? Because there is an intermediate state that we go to before we go to heaven. Now, if you think about this, it makes absolutely perfect sense. Because it says in Scripture, and I'm, everything is coming out of this book, it says in Scripture that when Jesus comes back, the dead in Christ will rise first. Now, if we're already in heaven, then why do we have to rise up again? It doesn't make any sense. Okay? So, in some way, our spirit and mind are separated from our body. Now, let me tell you something about the situation with my mom that affirmed this in my understanding of Scripture. On Sunday morning, okay, on the 21st, I got a call at 7 o'clock in the morning from mom's nurse saying she had had some type of cardiac event, they, a stroke. They weren't really sure. They had put her on a respirator. She was in the critical care unit. Praise the Lord, I called Wes at 7.15, and I said, I hate to throw this at you, brother, but you're up. And that's just part of being in the ministry. And I, the thing about it that I'm blessed is I had no concern or worry at all that Wes was going to do an awesome job, and he did. And he preached last week as well, and I thank him for that too. Melody and I jumped in the car, ran up there. We were up there from Sunday back and forth pretty much all week. Uh, Wednesday when I got home, I was pretty much wore out from going back and forth up there, staying three or four hours. And... Um, I told Melody, I said, I can't go up there Thursday. I'm just going to rest. I was in the office a little bit. And um, I said, I think tomorrow's the day. So she said, well, I'm going with you. We went up there on Friday. And um, the surgeon was standing at mom's room when we got there. And um, he did not want to give up. He was like, we can do a trach. We can put in a feeding tube. We can put her on dialysis. And I said, no. I told the nurse when I was up there Wednesday, with one of the nurses there in the critical care unit, we were just talking, and I said, well, I really only have one fear. Okay? And one thing I can tell you is you never quit fearing your mama. And my mom had a DNR. Okay, I didn't know this, but when you have a major surgery like that, they'll suspend the DNRs. And I understand why they do that, because most of those surgeons wouldn't do the surgeries if they don't think everything is going to be done to help that patient. They're in the business of keeping people alive, and they don't like it when they lose a patient. And I understand that and appreciate them for it. But I told that nurse, my greatest fear is my mom's going to wake up out of this mess and she's going to be ticked off at me. Luckily, my wife was there to help me make sure that doctor understood we're done. It's time. And so, make a long story short, how it all happened, when they took the respirator out, and they were giving her some kind of high-powered super drugs to keep her blood pressure up. All these years of taking medicine to keep her blood pressure down, and then they had to do something to keep her blood pressure up. When they took her off that, she lasted probably three minutes. Never blinked, 
never gaffed, never batted an eye, never wiggled a finger. The whole time, from Sunday all the way through. I did, and this is what I'm going to tell you. I think she was already gone. I think her, bot, her body was already separated from her mind and her spirit. Now, that doesn't happen in every occasion. And one of the reasons we waited a few days was because my uncle, her brother, who I called and talked to about all this, told me, um, you need to wait a few days because he had a situation with his son where he was in the hospital and they wanted to, they said, it's done, there's nothing left we can do, we need to just let him go. And, and my uncle wouldn't let him because he was a lot younger man and uh, they waited a few days and he woke up and came out of it and still alive today. Here's what I'm going to tell you about this. I've always said this, okay, doctors don't know. They don't know. They know a lot. They can help you, but when they say, oh, it's, it's going to be today or it might be tomorrow, and I'll be honest with you, sorry, doctors, we love you, but um, nurses know. Nurses know a lot of the time. So here's the thing. Here's what's happening in that passage in, in uh, Luke 16, 19 through 23. Um, in Acts 2, 34, it says, David has not ascended into heaven. Heaven and paradise are not the same. When Jesus died on the cross, he told the thief on the cross, this day you will be with me in heaven. Oh, no, he didn't say that, did he? He said, this day you'll be with me in paradise. By the way, paradise is not on earth. That's what the Jehovah's Witness teach, but it's not. Because Jesus wasn't with the thief in paradise on earth. He was wherever paradise is. Now, paradise, the Greek word means a royal park or garden leading to the palace. Sounds like a pretty good place to go until Jesus comes back. And that's when our physical body is, what, did, what does it say? When Jesus comes back, the dead in Christ shall rise first. Physical, spiritual, mental all come back together as one entity. And then we go be with him in heaven. Now we're still in the presence of God in paradise just like the thief on the cross was. Luke 32, 43, that's what Jesus said. Today you'll be with me in paradise. John 20, verse 17, three days later, he reminds the ladies, don't uh, touch my body. I'm not yet ascended to be with the Father. But he was alive. Acts 2, 31, um, Jesus went to proclaim the gospel to those that were in Hades, that's the abode of the dead, not hell. And it says he was not left in Hades. Of course, he went on back up to be with his father. Unfortunately, how do we get so confused about all this? Uh, in the King James Version of the Bible, they, the, uh, those that wrote the King James Bible used hell for all three terms Gehenna, Tartarus and Hades, three words let me help you with them Gehenna is the Greek word that means place of eternal punishment of the wicked, it's used 12 times that is hell and it means the place that it was created for Satan and his demonic angels that is Gehenna, it's used 12 times in the New Testament, Tartarus means a dark place, a prison, a dungeon, used only once in the New Testament in 2 Peter 2, 4. It's referred to in Jude 6 when it's talking about the fallen angels from Genesis chapter 6. Gehenna, Tartarus, Hades, or Sheol. Sheol is the Hebrew word for the abode of the dead. Literally unseen, hidden and it's used in the New Testament 11 times. Um, so the Hebrew word Sheol that you'll see, in, you see a lot of times in the Old Testament and the Greek word for Hades are the same place. But that is 
And then there is paradise. So, now in thinking about all this, let's look at 1 Corinthians chapter 15. Verse 54, starting with verse 54. Paul writes to the Corinthians and to us, But when this perishable will have put on the imperishable, and this mortal will have put on immortality, then will come about the saying that is written. And he quotes Isaiah 25, 8. Death is swallowed up in victory. And in 25.8, the word that they use um, and also um, that they use in Hosea 13 verse 4 for death is Sheol, the abode of the dead. Verse 55, O death, where is your victory? O death, where is your sting? It's all been dealt with now. He quotes the Old Testament, but in Christ Jesus, death has no more victory. It has no more sting. Because those who die in the Lord go to be in his presence in paradise, which is described in the Greek as a royal park or garden leading to the palace. That's where we go to get ready to be with Jesus when he returns and goes into heaven and takes us with him. Hopefully this gives some understanding into all of this for you. I feel like my mom was already gone on Sunday. Maybe even one day I'll find out that's not true. But I'm telling you the hardest thing I've ever done in my life is to have to tell them It's time to unplug and let her physical body go. It's hard. That's just all there is to it. It's just a hard thing. So when we die a physical death, our mind and our spirit are still alive. It leaves this body, and then you go, according to Scripture, to Hades, the abode of the dead. Hades is an all-encompassing term which includes Tartarus and paradise. Tartarus is a place for the wicked dead that await judgment. It's described as a dungeon, a dark place, a prison. Paradise is where we go and where we want to be. Those who have put their faith and trust in Jesus Christ as Savior and Lord. A palace, a garden that leads to the palace. You see, we don't even have to go through the great white throne judgment. But you can't go into heaven until they've had it. The wicked dead are the ones that go there. You see, what happens is what basically what happens in any courtroom, if you go before the judge and you're guilty, and then they're going to pass sentence. And for the wicked dead, it's going to be, depart from me. I never knew you. And where do they go? They go to Gehenna, hell. The place that was created not for them, but for Satan and his demonic angels. But the wicked dead go there as well. But what about believers? Those who have put their faith and trust that Jesus was the Son of God who died to take away our sins and pay the penalty for our sins so that we could be forgiven and be called righteous in the eyes of our Creator. The one who died and then rose again. Well, if you put your faith and trust in who Jesus said he was, according to this word of God, and believe that it is only through his shed blood that you have forgiveness of sin and the hope of eternal life, then you go to paradise and you await Jesus' return 
where he is going to, well, I say he, the trumpet blast is going to make the call. And the dead in Christ will rise. And those who have been in paradise waiting, their mind and their spirit and their body are reunited. And then they're taken into eternity. Because they're the ones that go before the judge. And the judge says, case dismissed. You're fine. Your penalty for your sins has been paid. And who is the judge? The Lord Jesus Christ himself. So he says, I paid the penalty for your sins. And you have received that. Enter into the joy of your master. Amen. That's how it's all going to happen. And now, my mom's up there with some of y'all's. Moms and dads and brothers and sisters and maybe even some children that went young. And we'll get to see him again. And what I like to call the great family reunion in the sky. So what do you gain in death? You gain rest. Over and over and over again, Paul, who wrote about two-thirds of the New Testament, almost exclusively uses the Greek term for sleep. To describe death. Now, that does not mean he doesn't use it in the sense that they're asleep. He uses it in the sense that they're resting. I think a better way to say it is they're at peace. The the peace that Paul talks about in Philippians. The peace of God which surpasses human knowledge and understanding and guards our hearts and minds until the day of Christ Jesus. The minute you go, you die, perfect peace. Then it it doesn't matter who's president. It doesn't matter if your electric bill gets paid or not. None of that. Nothing matters anymore. You are at total and complete peace as a child of God in paradise in the presence of the Lord. We gain rest. What else do we gain? We gain restoration. Now, um, a lot of times when I do services, I'll say reunion because I do think there's a reunion in a sense of those that have gone on before us. But I'm kind of rethinking that a little bit. I think there's restoration. I think everything that we didn't understand, we're puzzled about, confused about, whatever the case may be, I can tell you right now, I've been a Christian a long, long time. I've gone to seminary. I've studied God's Word. I don't know everything. If you think you do, then I want to sign you up to teach junior high Sunday school class. Because I'll promise you, they'll ask you a question that's going to puzzle your puzzler. But when we die and we go and be in the presence of the Lord... Our brain is restored to what God originally wanted it to be. And we have complete clarity and understanding about all the things that we can't get, we don't understand, maybe we didn't even like while we're here. It's really the next step of eternity. Just waiting on the return of our Lord and to receive our glorified body when we go be with him forever and ever and ever and ever. Now, don't ask about, well, how long is that going to be, preacher? And is it going to seem like... I'm telling you, when we step into paradise, we don't... Remember what I said? We're at perfect peace. So guess what? I've always said this. When we get into eternity, there's no crutches, there's no walkers, there's no canes, there's, there's no pain medication, there's no... No kind of medication, no blood pressure medication. I've had people make fun of me. Now, this wasn't Dr. Davis, but I had a doctor one time that was teasing me and said, Hey, preacher, you know, when, when we get into eternity, you're out of a job. And I looked at him and I said, Guess what? So are you. <laughs> See you in the choir, brother. No physical ailments whatsoever. Woo! Hallelujah! Isn't that awesome? Yeah. 
No eyeglasses. Oh, I can't wait. <laughs> yeah, no hearing aids, no, no, no straps, no knee braces, none of that stuff. Guess what? No watches. Do y'all know man invented time? <laughs> yeah. And, and Americans are the worst. I don't know why. You go to Africa, you go to Mexico City. I've been there three times. You go to Haiti, you might as well just leave your clocks and your watches at home. You start when they, everybody gets there and they say, okay, let's start. Um, and there's something good about that, by the way. It'll all be different. It'll all be paradise. We'll all be at peace. Restoration, though, of our mind and understanding and clarity of all these things. And then finally and lastly, reward. We'll have a reward 1 Corinthians 15, verse 58, that same passage where Paul writes, Therefore, my beloved brethren, be steadfast, immovable, always abounding in the work of the Lord, knowing that your toil is not in vain in the Lord. Now, let me just tell you, because this all sounds good, but this doesn't mean you get to sit at home in your easy boy chair in front of the TV and just say, I'm a believer. Oh, I know who Jesus is. I think if you really know who Jesus is, that there's going to be some way, somehow in your life, there's going to be a reflection, an understanding, if you will, some credible evidence in how you live your life that you're a follower of Christ. And just sitting back and taking it easy doesn't really prove much. You see, Jesus called his followers to go to work for him. Now, he did say, my burden is easy and my yoke is light. So when you serve the Lord, it shouldn't be a burden or a hardship. It ought to bring great joy in your life, much like the joy you experienced when you encountered Christ for the first time, the, the living God, the forgiveness of sin, and understood what had been done for your eternal salvation. Jesus' death on the cross. It will change you. The reward is all about Jesus. It's all about our Savior. Oh, yes, you'll get crowns in heaven. But Scripture says we take any crowns that we get and we lay him down at his feet. Why? Because he's the only one that's truly worthy. And anything that we do in this earth that is actually not burned up in fire, because all the wood, hay, and stubble of our works and things that we do, even me as a preacher, probably half my sermons may go up in smoke. I don't know. Hopefully there's some left. It's all because of Christ. Anything that we do that is worth anything is because of what Christ has done for us and in us. So the greatest reward that you could ever get, think about this. And I've always uh, envisioned it like Paul Burleson in his teaching about all this in death. is just a, just a big line of Christians, all believers, and our king. The Lord Jesus Christ. If you ever watch these coronations and things I have in England, you know, in the king, well, the queen, and they go down and who, they don't go greet everybody. Now they go greet, but the soldiers, a lot of times they'll go shake every one of their hands. They kind of do the same thing here, you know. Those who have served, maybe even gone to battle for their king. And they go down and Shake their hand. And I just think we're all going to rejoice when Jesus grabs us by the hand and kisses our cheek and says, Well done, thou good and faithful servant. Enter into the joy of my eternity. Woo! Nothing better than that. Nothing better than that. And then nothing else will matter because it's all just going to be heaven after that. I don't, I don't even know if I can describe it. 
but for those that don't know Jesus. And some of them, I'm afraid, are even going to be people that sit in churches Sunday after Sunday. Or maybe they watch somebody at home on TV. And they say, oh yeah, I believe in Jesus. But when they get to the judgment, they're going to hear Jesus say, depart from me, for I never knew you. But I did this and I did that and I did. But I never knew you. What happens when we die? I'm going to read this poem and then I'm done. Five minutes after I die, I've read it before, but it's it's pretty powerful. Loved ones will weep over my silent face. Dear ones will clasp me in sad embrace. Shadows and darkness will fill the place five minutes after I die. Faces that sorrow I will not see. Voices that murmur will not reach me. But where, oh where will my soul be five minutes after I die? Quickly the years of my life have flown, gathering treasures I thought my own. There I must reap the seeds I have sown five minutes after I die. Now I can stifle conviction stirred. Now I can silence the voice oft heard. Then the fulfillment of God's sure word five minutes after I die. Mated forever with my chosen throng, long as eternity, oh so long. Then woe is me if my soul be wrong, five minutes after I die. Oh, what a fool, hard the word, but true, passing the Savior with death in view, doing a deed I can never undo, five minutes after I die. Thanks to the Lord Jesus for pardon free. He paid my debt on Calvary's tree. Paradise gates will unfold even me five minutes after I die. Oh, marvelous grace that has rescued me. Oh, joyous moment when the Lord Jesus I see. Oh, happy day when with him I'll be five minutes after I die. The peace that I have comes because my mother wasn't always a Christian. But about 48 years old, she came to a revival when I was a part-time youth minister out at First Baptist Church Bluffdale. And after that revival, she got saved. And she got baptized out there at that little country church. And her life was changed forever. She wasn't perfect. But she knew Jesus. She was not afraid to die. The question I have for you today is, do you know him? Are you confident in your eternity? Let's pray together. Almighty God and Father in heaven, thank you so much for the mercy, grace, love, and forgiveness we've received through your Son, Jesus Christ. Father, it could be that there's someone here today that's unsure of their eternity. They have held back in giving their whole heart body, mind, and spirit to you. They're still living for their self, going after the world and its trinkets and pleasures. Father God, my prayer is that today could be the salvation for someone, that your Holy Spirit would bring them other, under conviction and an understanding that we are all sinners and fall short of your glory. And through your son, Jesus Christ, we can have forgiveness of sin and the hope of eternal life with you. 
being in your presence even five minutes after we die. Lord God, thank you for your word, the one thing we can stand on, depend on, to give us understanding and clarity about mysteries that we don't understand, even death. Thank you once again for Jesus and what he did for all of us. We pray it in his name.